All right, so we did last week, we had the, uh, the tabernacle. You guys remember, I drew the picture. Mm -hmm. We had the whole tabernacle. You guys can't see it from here. I got the fancy drawing here. I have it on the big thing. So you have the, uh, the Ark of the Covenant and what it symbolizes. Everything on it symbolizes a type of Christ. So you have the gold overlay over the acacia wood. Uh, and then you have the cherubim and God's presence rested between the cherubim because if you remember, that's where the high priest would come in and sprinkle the blood onto the mercy seat that would atone for the sins of Israel. That's the holiday that's known as Yom Kippur now, right? That this means in Hebrew, Day of Atonement. That's all it means. So the sacrifices were done every day. That was the sacrifice for all of Israel. And that's where the faith rested. Their faith didn't rest, was never meant to rest in their works. It was meant to rest in the blood, right? And what that blood signified. So their, tra their sins were transferred to the animal. That's transference. Just like our sins were transferred to Christ. Right? Christ never sinned. He knew no sin on this earth. Yet he bore the guilt of those sins. Same thing with that animal. Right? But that animal could not pay for sin in totality. He could not be, a, it was not a representative man. It did not pay for the sin debt that we have. It was merely a temporary covering. Which is why when man died, they didn't enter into the presence of God like we do now. They entered into paradise, which was the, you could say, in, in Luke 18, it goes into this, Luke 16, the rich man and Lazarus. There's a gulf between the burning side of hell and paradise. Okay, so but paradise, you were still under Satan's captivity, but you were comforted. You were not tortured. It was not a torturous place. It was paradise, right? But the legal hold that Satan had because of sin was not broken yet because Christ had not yet died. So it was Abraham's bosom, uh, the place of the righteous dead. When Christ died, he led captivity captive. So he took those people who were in paradise, they were still captives. He, he made them captives of, of himself and brought them down. Okay, where they reside now. Paradise is empty. And the, the thief on the cross was maybe the last person to ever go there. And he was there very, he had a short stay. It was, because he, right. So, okay, where was it? Okay, the sins of, the, of Israel. So then we have the entire tabernacle. And the tabernacle um, was where the presence of God would rest. And we'll see that, right? With the fire and the cloud as they traveled. And when that fire and that cloud traveled, it was their time to go. And that's so much like us as believers. When the, when the grace of God leaves you in a situation, right, it's probably time to move on. Right? The Lord will bring you throughout your life different places to do different things. Bring different people in your life. And then he'll move you. Right, this is a walk of faith. If you want a walk of sight, this isn't it. That's not Christianity. Christianity is a walk of faith. You're not going to see what you're going to do next. Right? You may be doing one thing for a long time. Right? I'm not saying that every day Jesus is going to he's going to uproot you, put you somewhere else. <clears throat> Most likely that's not going to happen. But there will be change. There will be seasons of change. There will be time of change. And the only thing that matters is following God. You want to be in the presence of God. You want to be in the presence of that fire and that cloud. You don't want to be there out, out on your own. Because there's no grace there. There's no grace in the flesh. All, right? all there is is destruction. All there is is it's, it's only going to get you farther from God. I'm not saying you're instantly going to turn into this awful person. But I'm saying you're not going to have the grace of God, the power of God working in every situation in your life. And that's what you want. You want As the church, as a believer, you want that in your life. Alright, so 28, 29, we go to the priesthood. So I'm sure you could see Christ in that. So the Old Testament, we're going to see Christ in everything. From, you know, all the way from the first book of the Old Testament to the last, we're going to see Christ in every single thing. Every single book. I mean, and that was the point. The point was is to show Christ uh, in type and in shadow so that when he came, he would be recognized and he would be accepted. And he was by some, but there were many who didn't. And you know who didn't? The ones who claimed to know the book better than anybody. The religious folk. Oh, the religious folk, <laughs> they, they will act as if, you know, they, they love God and they're serving God and they want the true God. But that's not what they're serving after. What they're doing is, is they're, they're using their own, their own flesh inside them. It needs to be appeased. It needs to do something. It needs to have control. It needs to feel a sense of pride. That's what they'll use to try to get to God. It's like the Tower of Babel. We'll, we'll build a tower up to the heavens. Right? Just like Cain 
I will offer the work of my own hands. Rather than looking at the way God's provided, knowing our own inability, saying, God, I can't save myself. I can't live righteous even for one day. Even as a saved, spirit-filled believer, I still have thoughts I shouldn't have. I still do things I shouldn't do. So how in me can I change myself? Can I fix myself? And that's the world's mantra, is fixing yourself. That's psychology. That's why I'll, I'll tell you how, how damnable psychology is. And you can't have Christian psychology. It doesn't mix. Now, there's Christian counseling. Don't get me wrong. But it's this. It's I got the answer. It's here. It's not in here. It's in here. So let's, let's go. And maybe the leading and guiding the Holy Spirit, we can go into that. But that's ministering. Ministering just means to attend to the needs of others. I've seen many of you minister. You're all ministers of the Word. I've seen you comfort other believers. And that's all it is. That's ministering. You're comforting other believers with the Word. And that's, that's the only way to minister, because that's the only thing uh, a believer or an unsaved person can ever be comforted by. True comfort is by the Word, by the Word of God. You're not comforted by the things of the world. The things of the world won't comfort you. They'll deceive you. They will deceive you. They'll trick you, because they'll make you think you're comfortable. Oh, just get that, that new car that you saw in that commercial. It's fast. It's nice. Look how everybody will view you if you have that. Of course, that's not what they say, but that's what they use. You realize advertising is one of the most psychology-heavy mediums there is. And what do they appeal to? They appeal to your, your flesh. That's what they're trying to appeal to. They don't say lay up your treasures in heaven. They say lay up your treasures here on earth. Because others will view you in a way that will be beneficial to you, beneficial to your pride. So God will give you nice things. There's nothing in here that says take a vow of poverty. Nothing. But there is something in here that says that you're a bond slave of Christ. You fix your eyes on Him. Anything else you need will be given unto you. Right? We, don't, we never fix our eyes on anything but the bond that we have with God. The relationship. And that's the cross, right? Jesus Christ said the new covenant in my blood, the, the Lord's Supper service that we're going to have today, is exactly that. The new covenant in my blood. That's what we're looking back to. That's why this is one of the ordinances that the Lord instituted for us to continually do, to continually point us back to the relationship that we have with God, which is through the cross. That's the only place our eyes are ever fixed. And if our eyes are there, everything we ever need or could ever ask or think will be given to us. God's presence will reside with us. If we start to look at those, well, I think I need this, I think I need that, let me do this, let me do that. You'll just get caught up in your own works, you'll get caught up getting led by your own flesh, and you get led astray, you'll be confused, you'll be frustrated, and you'll walk a Christianity that is not what God intended. Okay? You'll not walk in victory. That's walking in victory. Walking in victory is walking every day with the power of God. At your back, not walking, try to walk against it, but without it, right? So, I don't know where I was. The priesthood. We're at the priesthood, okay? The priest is a type of Christ. The priesthood was a type of Christ. So we're in Exodus 28. Uh, ministering between man and God, right? There are no priests today except, well, okay, let me, let me say this the right way. A priest is one who has access to God. All right. In the Old Covenant, there was a way that it was done. All right. There was a way that God wanted it to be done. Because Christ did not yet die. Individual believers could not enter into the presence of God. Because like I said, the sin had not been paid for. Because the blood of bulls and goats could not wash away sin. So they had to go through a priesthood which was, once again, a type of Christ to come, a type of our intercessor to come, a type of one who could intercede or uh, speak to God on our behalf, right? And Christ doesn't, don't think because Christ is sitting at the right hand of the Father, He has to say everything to God that we bring to Him. His mere presence allows us access to the throne of God. you got to understand that. His mere presence at the right hand of God says sin is paid, Believers can access. That's it. That's why we can enter into the Holy of Holies now. That's why that veil was torn in two when Christ died. Remember, we went over the veil last week. 
It was a signification of the fact that you could not enter into the presence of God. Merely that high priest once per year. And he had to do a lot of things right so that when he went in there, he didn't die. Okay? So, we are, first of all, let me give you one thing. There's only one high priest, and that's Christ. But we are all kings and priests with God. What does that mean? Well, we can all enter into the presence of God. Now, we can all boldly come to the throne room of grace. And the reason is not. We don't come boldly because of us. Quite the contrary. We come boldly because of the work. The work of Christ was so great that it will allow us entrance. Right? Our entrance is granted because Christ sits at the right hand of the Father. Because he paid for our sin debt, we can enter into the presence of God. There is no man, no human man on this earth, who will give you the access to God. That's why the priesthood in the Catholic Church, to me, is so revolting. Because there is nothing that this sinful man can do to get me closer to God. Not a thing. I have access to God. That's what Christ paid for, to bring me to Him. But I have to confess my sins to a man who gives me absolution, who will give me a, a forgiveness? Or doesn't, or doesn't give me forgiveness? <laughs> who is He? Right? I, to me, when you see it from the outside looking in, knowing the Word of God now, and knowing the role of Christ, to look to a man, I cringe when I see people. Listen, I'm going I'm to share a story, all right? Before, before I make fun of anybody else, I make fun of myself. I went, I, you all know I was Catholic, I was raised Catholic. I went to see the Pope, I don't know if you remember, like 05 or 06, maybe 07 even. The Pope uh, Benedict came to New York City. And I went to go see him. I actually went with a group uh, from the Catholic Church. It was Catholic Church in Lindhurst. That's Sacred Heart. That's Sacred Heart. Yep, we went there. I was a parishioner. Yeah. So was I. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hang on. Yeah. yeah. So we went there, went with a group. Not really, but. <laughs> uh, it was all, I was, I was by far the youngest person there. And uh, it was like Moses leading people through the wilderness, <laughs> trying to get around the subway and get them back with the enormous crowds right down Fifth Avenue. But uh, I remember going there and seeing the throngs of people, seeing the people weeping before the Pope. Mm -hmm. The Pope was coming. And I remember seeing some people over off to the side protesting. I didn't get it at the time, but they were protesting the Pope in there. And uh, I didn't understand, but it was all about Jesus. This Pope's not, Pope's just a man, you know, just, why are you bowing down to him? Why are you worship? Oh, we don't worship the Pope. Meanwhile, he comes by. Oh, yeah. Yeah, what's that? Yeah, right. I mean, come on. That's very much worship. Worship is is just this joyful adoration and and putting somebody above you. Right? So that's me making fun of myself. So I was there. I wasn't weeping or anything like that. I, took, I actually snapped a picture of him as he got by. Um, so that's that's that. But now when I see it and I look back and I see people who weep. For the Pope. You know what? I, I don't mean to make fun of them because I do believe, maybe not all, but some of these people, they do want to get to God. They do want access to God. They want God in their lives. And and I wanted God in my life. Because I knew he was real. I always knew he was real. I knew he was there. But I always felt this rift. And anything I could do to connect myself with God, I tried to do it. And that's what the church prays on. They say, this ritual will get you closer to God. This, the Pope will get you closer to God. Praying to this saint will get you closer. Find this saint. Pick a saint that you want, that you like. And do this, and do that. And I told you, you see where the scapula, right? The scapula thing? Yeah, yeah. Because I told some guy, told me, if you, if you die wearing that, you will definitely go to heaven. Yes. Right? Really? Yes. yes. Somebody yes. told me. And there's a million things that I didn't even know. There's still more and more rules that I, I didn't even know. But there's, because everything, why? Why? Because they don't know. They don't know if they're right with God. They don't 100% know if they're going to go to heaven. So they have to invent these things to give them a sense of comfort because it's too jarring to think that I don't know. Even with all this work that I'm doing, even with my mass attendance and my confession of my sins, I still don't know if I'm going to heaven. And that's troubling for the soul. The soul wants peace of mind. Peace, you know, your soul wants to know it's right. I would cry out for that. The Bible says that His Spirit bears witness on our spirit that we're sons and daughters of God. Right? Because that's when you're when you're truly saved. That's what the Lord will do. He doesn't want you to have a life of not knowing. He wants you to know. God's a fair and just God. He doesn't want to say, "Well, maybe." 
Oh, just maybe if you try harder. He wants to say, God's very black or white. I mean, that's the Bible. If you're not for me, you're against me. You're either in or you're out. It's, there's no gray area with God. It's very simple. So that access that I wanted to God, I found in Christ. When my brother said to me, it's not about what you do, Adam. It's about what Christ has done for you. And that's the priesthood. Christ is the only one who will allow you entrance into the presence of God. No, it's not our works. It's certainly not some sinful man on this earth. Right? But the priesthood was instituted for Israel because, like I said, Christ had not yet come. And he had not yet paid. And he was type and shadow of, of what was to come. All right. So let me give you an idea of the priestly garments. You may look at these and say, okay, they sound nice. But they were intricate, intricately designed in God's manner for a reason. Because there's one way God wants things done. And it's either God's way or it's your way. That's it. Just like a cross. You can either come to God through the blood of Christ, or you can come a multitude of millions of other ways, but you will not get to God going any other way. There's only one way, one mean. What's What sounds like a fair, just God? A God who makes it simple and gives you one way and says, choose you this day? Or a God who tries to confuse you and trick you and say, oh, well, you just got to figure it out for yourself. Well, I don't know, and, and she says something different than I say, and he says something different than I say, and, 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 you know, I don't know. I don't know if I'm right with God, right? That doesn't sound like a just God to me. That's like me with my son being like, well, you know, Dylan, you can get this piece of candy, but I'm not going to tell you what to do. Uh, you just got to do something, all right? Go ahead and do something. And he does the wrong thing, and I say, nope, right? That, how is that fair or just as a father? It's not. I would say if you clean your room, you get this cleans his room, he gets it. He doesn't clean his room, he doesn't get it. That's it. That's God. He's a loving Father. Is there the judgment hand of God? Absolutely. Don't forget it. The world needs to know that. But God is a loving Father who wants you in His arms. He sent His Son to die for you. He wants to, he wants to have His presence leading and guiding you every step of your life to help you. Right? But do we submit to that? I mean... Even as believers was strong. But that's the fight of faith. Paul said, fight the good fight of faith. If you believe in Christ and what he's done as being enough for you, that's enough, that's all I need. It's already done and I believe it. Great. Now God will work. Oh, I got a problem. Well, I think I'll try to work it out. Hold on. No. That's when it's tested. That's when you actually test. Well, you say you believe. Let's see it. I'm going to turn the heat up a bit. Let's see if, that, if you really still stay with your face saying... Oh, this is tough, but God's going to work it out. He promised it. He said he's going to, he said to trust in him with all his heart. Lay not out of my own understanding. I'm going to do that. All right? And we're going to fail that many times. Our whole life is going to do that. Right? But slowly, more and more, the control and power will be pulled, ripped out of your hands. Right? As, as you begin to let it go in situations, and you realize, wow, God took care of that for me. I'll trust him for this. I'll, I'll trust him. It's going it's to be hard to, to not worry and, and to hand it over to him. Listen, God's not interested in your performance because your performance is never going to be great. He wants your faith. He's, we've called, we've called to be faithful. He just wants your faith. He knows you're going to mess up. He knows you're going to doubt. You're going to worry. I mean, look at Simon Peter in the garden. I mean, look at some of the great men and women of faith in the Bible. You're going to stop. You're going to mess up. This is not a walk of perfection. It's a walk of direction. Where are you headed? Are you headed towards glory or are you headed somewhere else? Amen. So we have the priestly garments, okay? In Exodus 28, chapter 5. They shall take the gold, blue, purple, and scarlet thread and fine linen. They shall make an ephod of gold, blue, purple, and scarlet thread, and fine woven linen, artistically worked. And shall have two shoulder straps joined at its two edges. And so it shall be joined together and the intricately woven band of the ephod, which is on it, shall be of the same workmanship made of gold, blue, purple, and scarlet thread, and fine gold linen. Jonathan, I got a question for you. On that computer, can you uh, see if it's connected to the internet? If it is, can you Google the high priest um, see. and see if it pulls up a picture? I want to give you guys an idea what this looks like. There are some, some drawings and some ideas. They'll just give you an idea. Are any of them spot on perfect? I don't know. I mean, there are some things here that you can leave to interpretation as far as how, how you know, the exact colors and stuff. But Okay, so the shoulder straps. 
That represents the strength of Christ. Because this priest was coming in as a type of Christ, the high priest. Represents the strength of Christ on his shoulders. You know, essentially carrying the world on his shoulders. 28 and 15. The breastplate. You shall make the breastplate of judgment. Artistically woven according to the workmanship of the ephod, you shall make it. Gold, blue, purple, and scarlet thread and fine woven linen. Oh, by the way, uh, on this, I'm sorry, I forgot to read this verse. It said you shall, in verse 9, on the shoulder straps, then you shall take two onyx stones and engrave on them the names of the sons of Israel. Alright, so that was all the names. The strength was over them. He was the one giving them strength. And he was their strength. The Lord. And then the same thing with the breastplate, okay? In the breastplate, the names are inscribed, inscribed on the breastplate too. The breastplate is the love of God, right, over his heart, you know? All right, now we have uh, 28 and 36. And you shall also make a, uh, so this is the crown. There was a crown, it's, it's called a turban. And uh, he would put it on its head and it said, you shall make a plate of pure gold and engrave on it, like engraving a signet, holiness to the Lord. So there was a crown, it had a gold plate here, and it was referring to the, obviously the holiness of Christ. So Christ was holy, and because of his holiness, we can enter into the presence of God. Amen? All right, so that was the, the main pieces of the uh, priestly garments that were given. So the high priest acted as mediator in type. Jesus fulfilled that type. And when Jesus came, he didn't come to abolish the law. Right? He said it himself. He came to fulfill the law. Which means... We don't have to fulfill the law. Right. Even if, type in the word ephod, E-P-H-O-D. If you type that up in the Google, a lot of times it'll come up that way. Mm -hmm. um, so Jesus Christ, right, we don't have to be law keepers. We don't have to be people who seek after fulfilling the law. What does that mean? Our performance. Being good. Is it good to be good? Of course it is. Let's not be ridiculous here. Grace is not a reason to sin. It's a it's a reason to, to live free from sin. Do you have just a picture? Is there just an image that... that yeah, it's a, well, yeah. All right, well, you just keep working on it. We'll see what we can find out. Um, so, all right, grace. So here's the idea here. Christ came, fulfilled the law perfectly. The law, the keeping of the law now is never your focus. You never need to think about the keeping of the law perfectly. Ever. You never need to say, I need to do better. Now listen, it is good. we got to get this straight. It is a good feeling to be convicted when you sin. That's good. That's correction. God's showing you what's bad, pointing you towards what's right. But you don't think when you sin and you fail and you screw up and you do something you know you ought, to, ought not to do. You don't say, what do I need to do to fix this? There's only one way to, for it to be fixed. And that's Faith in the cross. Faith in the covenant that you have with God. Because that's where the power to live free from sin comes. For the law of the spirit of life has made me free. In Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. So because of what Christ did, if you believe in him, holy, for him to fix you, he will. All right? Like I said last week, when you work, God rests. But when you rest, God works. Okay? When you're resting... That's why we're saying we're going to get on the Sabbath in a minute. We have rest every day. You may not feel like it. Because you may be in a place where you are trying, in part at least. All right, there's some pictures of it. Uh, yeah, right at the bottom. Click on the bottom guy. See if you can pull him up. Yeah, there you go. So that's an idea. Okay, can everybody see that? Just an idea of what he would look like. You see the breastplate or the, uh, the gold on his forehead? That was inscribed holiness to the Lord. The white was uh, symbolizing uh, righteousness, uh, holiness, I mean purity. You have that breastplate with the 12 stones. Um, then you have the uh, you know, the rest of the garments and then the shoulder straps up there. I've seen the shoulder straps done. It's tough to see in there. I've seen them done in a different way, but either way, that's what he looked like when he went. So and everything there was a type of Christ and a type of and you, and you can look it up when you get home, too. There's some other good pictures that are out there. Thank you, John. Um, so, if you want to keep the law, keeping the law is a good thing. Yeah, of course, right? Doing the right thing. right? Living righteous, living free from sin. Sin isn't good. God does not abide with sin. 
If you're doing anything bad, it's you. If you're doing anything good, it's God. Okay? So you, you want to do good things. Is, okay, when, when, as you live free from sin, it, it will bring peace to your spirit. It will bring you back. In, it, you will be in, in greater fellowship with God. Right? When God's working in you, He'll give you a peace that you can't get any other way. The world can't give it to you. And the things of the world can't give it to you. They're empty. They have nothing to give you. They'll, chase, they'll make you chase after them. But when you get to the end of the line, you realize there's nothing there. They'll make your flesh chase after different things, money, drugs, whatever it is. You'll go that route. But then you'll hit the end and you'll realize there's nothing here. But true peace in your spirit, and you've all felt it. I hope, right? You felt more times when you're at more peace than others. And you feel God working in your life. I'm at peace. Like, you know, I just, it's, it seems like the things of the world have grown strangely dim. I just don't care about all the other things going on. And, you know, maybe there's things going on in my life that should trouble me, but I have peace. All right? God will work in your life to do those things when you're trusting Him to do those things. When you're still in some part, way, shape, or fashion trying to do it on your own, He won't do it. Because He's going to show you that you don't have the ability to do it yourself. So Christ was, He kept the law perfectly. Don't focus on your performance before God. Focus on your faith. Focus making sure, am I trusting God with everything? The small things, right? Well, we can do the small things on our own, Adam, right? Just little things. No! Nothing! Without me, you can do no thing. Nothing. Okay? And you want God in. The creator of this earth, the creator of the universe, the creator of you, He designed you. He's got the manual. He knows. Alright? He can do all the things in your life that you need if you trust Him. Okay, so I think I hammered that point. All right, so now we have the, the offering. So in 29, uh, 38 to 46. So go to 29, 38 in Exodus. And we'll probably, we'll probably get through all Exodus. Today, because there's not. Okay, so they're still on the mountain. All right, so let's place this. About 1446 B.C., they're still on Mount Sinai. Moses had received, just received the Ten Commandments. He's receiving instruction from God. He's getting Bible teaching from God, right? Here's, how you, here's what you're going to do. I'm about to give you this land. Here's what you're going to do to look before me. So that's, what, that's what's going on. 29 and uh, 38. Now this is what you shall offer on the altar. Two lambs of the first year, day by day, continually. One lamb you shall offer in the morning, and the other lamb you shall offer at twilight. With the lamb, one-tenth of an ephah of flour mixed in, and one-fourth uh, of a hint of pressed oil, and one-fourth of a hint of wine as a drink offering. Okay, so morning and evening. Let's tie this back to Christ. Right? Christ was nailed to the cross at 9 a.m. Six hours later, he gave up his spirit. The morning and the evening offering. That's when the times of the morning and the evening offering were. Right? So that's what that symbolized. Okay? When Christ would be nailed to the cross and when he would give up his spirit. Because remember, he wasn't killed. He wasn't murdered. He gave himself as an offering. He could have lived and destroyed everyone on earth who came against him. But he decided that he would be the sin offering for us. Willingly. He willingly gave up his spirit. He willingly gave his body and his blood on our behalf. But these were constantly given. Why? Because sin hadn't been paid. There needed to be work done to continually atone for the sins. And it was the faith in these offerings, the continual faith in these offerings, as an Old Testament believer. So you see Old Testament people walking around like that priest look with the beard and the robes. How'd they go to heaven? How'd they get to God? Well, listen, the Old Testament economy was different. The Old Testament economy, it was still based off faith and God's grace, but the working of the Holy Spirit could not indwell a believer. So that, that same power that we have now as the church to live for God, they didn't have that indwelling of the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit could not be inside them because the sin debt had not been fully paid. So the temple had not been cleansed, so to speak. But they lived by faith. Abraham lived by faith. They all lived by faith. In the blood. In the blood of those animals that they sacrificed, right? 
And they could have easily went through a ritual of just throwing the animal up there, killing it, and ah, we killed the animals for today, right? But if they understood what that sacrifice meant, they first needed to understand that they were sinners. Because why, why are you offering up a sacrifice if you're not a sinner? You have nothing to atone for. You have nothing that needs to be paid for. That's just us coming to Christ. You first got to understand that you have a sin debt that you owe to God. You've sinned against Him. He created you. You've sinned. Right? All of sin and fall short of the glory of God. So to turn to Christ and turn away from your sin, you first have to realize there is a sin. It's just, you, don't, you can't accept the Savior unless you see your need to be saved. Like the, the, the life uh, preserver in the ocean. Somebody throws your life preserver. You're like, I'm swimming just fine. But you don't see the tidal wave that's heading towards you. And that's judgment. That's the day of judgment when we have to stand before God. There will be a day when you will stand before God. I promise you that. And you will account for how you have lived this life. And you will say one of two things. You will say, you know, you'll act as your own attorney. Right? I defend myself. Well, God, I tried to be a good person and I did some good things and this and that. And then God will roll out the scroll of your sins and say, well, those things were good. You should have done those. Well, what say you about all these penalties? Just like standing before a judge, right? So he's going to list the charges. And you don't have a defense because you've done nothing to pay for those sins because the only thing that pays for sins is the blood. So you can act as your own attorney, try to defend yourself, and end up eternally separated from God in hell. Or you can say, I, I plead the blood of Jesus. He paid for my sins. This guy right here sitting next to you, my Savior, he paid the price. And God will say, enter in. Because that's the only way to get in. There's one way. Jesus Christ is the door. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the light. No man comes to the Father but by Him. So these sacrifices, when these, these folks in the Old Testament, remember, the first prophecy that was given and passed down for generations was in Genesis 3.15. The seed of the woman crushing the head of the seed of the serpent. And it was, so it was understood that sin was going to be defeated by a redeemer. And then God in Genesis 3.21 clothes them in tunics of skin. So he takes their fig leaves off. They cover their sin, right? Their nakedness, their sin, in fig leaves. They're embarrassed. They see themselves now. They have sin for who they are. So they try to weave fig leaves to cover themselves. A type of the work of your own hands. A type of religion. A type of trying to get to God in your own power. God says that won't cover your sins. Kills an animal before them. Clothes them in tunics of skin. So God's the one who does the work. God's the one who clothes them. And by Cain and Abel, we see they understood the sacrifice, right? Abel understood it. And God even said to Cain, if you want, just do what's right and you'll be accepted, right? It's, it's easy. The, the Abel didn't think about it. He just did what I said and he was accepted. Cain tried, he tried to do his own thing, put the work of his own hands and impress God with his own work rather than just trusting in God had already given him. So the sacrifice they had understood, the sacrifice, the altar, the sacrifice, look at Abraham, right? Abraham understood the altar and the sacrifice when he walked up the mountain of Isaac. He knew what the sacrifice meant. So they believed that those animals, right, were paying for their sin. The blood was shed and their sin was paid. And their faith was in that, not in their own works. They understood there was things expected of them, but that's not what got them to God, right? Because they were doing this before Abraham was before the law. Before the Ten Commandments, before this was all given, they were doing this. All right? So that was never their means to get to God. So the morning and the evening offering was what their faith would, would stay in, the offering of blood, in order to atone for their sins. All right, chapter 31. I'm going to skip around here a little bit. We're going to finish up. Chapter 31 and 14. So they're still getting the instructions on the tabernacle and everything. I just want to touch on these this verses, 31, 14, and 15. You shall keep the Sabbath, therefore, for it is, a, it is holy to you. Everyone who profanes it shall surely be put to death. For whoever does any work on it, that person shall be cut off from among his people. Work shall be done for six days, but the seventh is the Sabbath of rest, holy to the Lord. Whoever does any work on the Sabbath that day shall surely be put to death. Well, what does that mean? Uh, do I keep the Sabbath? What do I do now as a believer? I, I want, it's one of the Ten Commandments. I, I want to be right before God. I don't want to do something wrong. I don't know what to do. First of all, let's get this straight. The Sabbath is Friday sundown to Saturday sundown. It's not Sunday. Never has been. Never will be. Sunday is not the Sabbath. Okay? Let's, first we have that straight. Saturday. Second of all, the Sabbath rest is accomplished in Christ. Christ
Christ is our Sabbath rest. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So here's what happens. Christ died on the cross. It freed us from our work. That's what the Sabbath did, right? It freed you. It gave you a free day from your work. We live in the Sabbath now. Christ is our Sabbath rest. Notice what he says here. Everyone who profanes it shall surely be put to death. Wait, what does he say? Okay. Whoever does any work on the Sabbath day, he shall surely be put to death. So what does that mean? If you, instead of resting in the Sabbath rest, which is Christ, accepting Christ's work and what he's done, try to work yourself together, which we religion does, we went over, try to use your own works to get to God, you will be put to death. You will not enter into heaven. Those will not get you to God. Works versus faith. You can either work your way to heaven, which doesn't happen. Try to work your way to heaven, I should say. Or you can believe God and what He's done for you at the cross, for Christ. That will get you to heaven. That's an easier way, right? I want rest. I feel weary a lot. I don't know about anybody else. Maybe you guys are all strong. I see the halos floating over your heads. <laughs> I'm not that strong. I get weary. I get beat down by a world that is against God. Right? It used to be God bless America, now it's like God less America. Right? They, they don't seem in any way to want God as part of this nation. And as a believer, you are a pilgrim just passing through. You need to understand that. This is not your permanent home. Brother Mark Handy last year gave a great message. He was talking about migrant workers who come to this country. Right? And oftentimes, they don't plan on staying here. They send all the money they make back home. Right? They send it back home. Because they're not making this a permanent home. They're, you know, just, they're laying up treasure where their home is. That's us. We're passing through here with a job to do. And that job is to be the salt and light of this earth. Ambassadors for Christ. And the way we live and what we say. Right? But we're not laying up our treasures here because we're not staying here long. Think of 70, 80, 90 years even, if you're given that, in the hourglass of eternity. It's nothing. It's but nothing. And we can't understand. I understand what even saying in your minds, in my mind, we can't grasp it. But we understand the idea that there is an eternity, that there is a never ending. Right? It's, it's tough to think of your soul just not existing anymore. I, th I find that is a tougher thought. And the Bible says eternity was created in the hearts of man. I find it difficult to think of the idea of my soul just not existing anymore. Which is why it's so beautiful when you think about how life is given, and it's only given by God, that a soul, an existence of a soul, comes from nothing. God breathes it into existence. There's no, there was no pre-existence of your soul until God created it. God's the only creator. He is a creator. Which means he takes, he makes something out of nothing. We may think of that as commonplace or just something we already know, but when we really start to think about it, it's, it's amazing to think that man, in all his infinite wisdom and power and greatness, we couldn't create a grain of sand from nothing. We can make things, right? This whole church was made. But we didn't create any of this. And it's not a creator. Man makes something from something else. God makes something from nothing. And he's the only one who can do it. So to think, I mean, to also think that our soul would be destroyed or no longer exist, it's difficult to understand. For me, it's easier to understand that our soul is housed somewhere for eternity. Some place we will be for eternity. And that is true. We'll either be in heaven or we'll be in hell. We'll be in the presence of God or we'll be in a separation from God. So you have two choices. So Sabbath rest. Rest is our faith and work is, well, work. So those are your two options. The Sabbath has not been abolished. Remember, Jesus didn't abolish any of the law. He fulfilled it. Fulfilled it in totality. All right, so now we're going to go into chapter 32 real quick. So Moses is up on the mountain. I'll, I'll paint the picture for you. Moses is up on the mountain. He receives all the instructions from God. Right? Gets the Ten Commandments. Has the tablets. Comes back down. And while he's up there, here's what happens. And remember, Aaron is the first. He's Moses' brother. And he's the first high priest of Israel. So a guy who should have known better. 
<laughs> Verse 32. Now when the people saw that Moses delayed in coming down from the mountain, the people gathered together, and we're in Exodus 32, gathered together to Aaron and said to him, Come, make us gods that shall go before us. Gods with a small g, obviously. For this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land, we don't know what's become of him. So what's he doing up there? We don't know what happened. Maybe he's dead. We have no idea where he is. So they went to Aaron and say, make us some uh, gods that we can follow. How soon they forget. They just witnessed the power of God in the Red Sea. Moses parting the Red Sea. Pharaoh's army being drowned. Being taken out of their bondage, of which they groaned to be released from. And now they're asking for other gods. Aaron said to them, what does Aaron say to them? Serve the true and living God. Bow down only to Him. There are no gods but Him. Now, Aaron said to them, Break off your golden earrings, which are in the ear of your wives, your sons, your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people broke off their golden earrings, which were in their ears, and brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold from their hand, and he fashioned with them an engraving tool, and made a molded calf. And they said to him, This is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. Not a good start for the high priest of Israel, right? When Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it. So not only did they build this statue, now they're going to sacrifice to it. And Aaron made it. See the twisting, though? See the twisting? Because the sacrifice is purely to God. I mean, the sacrifice is right. You do sacrifice unto God for the payment of your sins. But now they make this fake God, and they start sacrificing to this. That's what the church does a lot of times, right? Well, Adam, what are you talking about? Turn on your TV on some so-called Christian TV stations and listen to some guy preach to you about how God, He wants to bless you. He wants to put money in your bank account. He wants to put a new car. And if you don't believe it, you're just not thinking positive thoughts. That is bowing down to a different God. You've created your own God. You've created a God who just wants to give you all the things that your flesh wants. And they twist Bible verses to make it sound realistic. God's not here to make you happy. He's here to make you holy. And if you're holy, and you're holier, and you, can, and you can enter into the presence of God, and God works in your life, you will have joy. Which, let me tell you, joy beats happiness any day. Happiness is fleeting moment to moment. Oh, I got this thing. Look at this shiny thing. Wow, this is great. And then it goes away. Then you want something else. Joy is peace in your spirit. Joy is what Paul and Silas had, had in the Philippian jail when they were singing praises unto God when they were in the inner dungeon and God sent an earthquake and shook that prison and got them out. And then they saw the jailer saved. That's joy. Joy is, I don't care what the situation is. Situations are going to change. Some are going to be good, but some are going to be bad. But i got a joy in my heart that can't be taken away because I know that my Redeemer lives. I know my Savior I know where I'm going after this because I have hope. Hope is not when I wish upon a star. Oh, I just wish this will happen. Hope is I know this is going to happen and I'm looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to that day. That's hope. Joyful expectation. That is hope. And we have hope as believers. And the Bible says hope does not disappoint. Hope doesn't disappoint. Because you know no matter what, no matter how bad your day is going, you're going to heaven. If you believe in Christ, you're going to heaven. There's a better place for you. And as you read this word, and as you grow as a believer, your hope will grow. Because your faith grows, and when your faith is strengthened and grows, as faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word. So as this word is continually implanted into you, your faith is strengthened and grows, and as your faith is tested by fire, it grows. And these things are made manifest in your life more and more and more. So maybe that hope that you didn't have, you're like, Adam, I'm sitting here today, I don't have much joy. I don't have much peace in my spirit. And keep believing. That's it. There's no other tricks. There's no Adam's 21 days or tricks to happiness and peace. And New York Times, next New York Times bestseller, right? I can, I, I guarantee. Listen, I could write something like that and have it sell many copies. I mean, you could. You could fake it. People want that. They gobble that up. The world gobbles that up because they just want another thing that's like some quick fix that they think that they can. You know, everything's gonna be right. But this is a walk of faith. It is a continual growing and walking of faith, and God tests you and, and brings you through things. But it's an amazing walk, I'll tell you that. I'll tell you that. Being able to walk by Him and see some of the things that He'll do in your life, it's amazing. <clears throat> so, they build an altar to this thing. Moses comes down. I'm going to finish this up quick. 
So Moses comes down. He says, get down, verse 7, for your people have brought, uh, that you brought out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly to the way which I commanded them. They have made themselves a molded calf and worshiped and sacrificed to it. This is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. The Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people. They are indeed a stiff-necked people, stubborn people. So that, and that's a very, that verse right there, how quickly they have turned aside. There's a verse like that that's very similar in the book of Galatians. When they talk, I marvel how so soon you've been removed from, from the faith, right? It happens to believers too. They start to put up other things in their lives. They believe in Christ. They're saved. They're born again. And then they start to see other things. It's like I was talking about. Other things out there that they can go after and serve that. And, oh, maybe that's an easier way. Those guys seem to be real smiley and they have a bunch of money. I'll tell you why some of those preachers have a lot, a lot of money. I'll tell you why. It's very simple. Because they're at the top of the Ponzi scheme. Okay? They just keep getting people to send more money in. Tell them. That, you, I don't, I'm going off on a tangent, but I, I want to help warn you. You've seen this stuff on TV where they're selling like holy oil from the, the holy, the holy water from the holy. Please don't tell me you guys buy that stuff. <laughs> I, it, it'll break my heart if you did. I'm telling you. Some of that, listen, they're trying to sell you a thing to put your faith into, right? Just like this, this stupid calf thing. They're trying to sell you something else to put your faith into, and that's of the devil. Because the devil doesn't have to get his eye. You don't. You don't the devil doesn't say, "Oh, look at me, the devil, worship me." He doesn't do that. He says, get your eyes off Christ. Because that's all you need to do. That's easier. I mean, most people wouldn't, you know, you'd see some people who are Satanists. But most people, that's not the masses that he gets. The masses, it's just a delusion. He just gets your eyes on something else that sounds holy-ish. It, it has Bibleese in there, right? It, it, it has a very god sounding like, cleanliness is next to godliness. Like, something like that, right? You, you all know it's not in the Bible. Right? That's not a Bible verse. All right, so... He'll get your eyes on something else, and that'll be where your faith will be placed. Your faith is placed in that. Oh, this water. If I have this water, it'll bless me. Okay. If I have that oil from the Holy Land, it'll bless me. If I sow a fake seed, I'll get something back. Listen, you gotta understand the principle of giving and the promise of giving. The principle of giving is this you're laying up treasure in heaven. So that what you're doing is supporting the work of God on this earth. Because you want to see souls saved, right? You want to see more people go to heaven than not. Am I right? I do. Your family, your friends. Think of them not going to heaven. Because there's only one other place, hell. I don't want that to happen. So I'm going to see more go than less. And that's what the work of God does in this earth. Because the work of God spreads the gospel. And the gospel says, man, you're a sinner. You need to turn from your sin and accept Christ. That's it. It doesn't say you need to look to this or look to that. You never hear that preach in most of those services. That are all about money. That are all about this. You never hear the cross. The cross that's easy. Adam, how do I know? How much do they preach on the cross? That's it. That's your one dividing line. How much do they talk about the cross? How much do they talk about what, what happened at the cross and what man's relationship is to that? That that's the only way to get to God. Focus on Christ and Him crucified. Paul said, I determined not to know anything among you, save Christ and Him crucified. Because that was the only thing that was going to bring anything to the people's lives. Right? Not their focus. Now, Paul didn't come selling his wares. Like, oh, and I have all these, these godly things that will enhance your Christianity. No, it won't. There will be a detriment to it. So, the gold calf, I'm tying it all back together. Just wait. The gold calf was just something else for them to place their faith into. They needed something to see. Rather than living by faith, they wanted to live by sight. They wanted to have something they could hold in their hands. Rather than the invisible God. right? Rather than Christ, who he is and what he's done. They wanted something else. And that's what they got. They worshipped it. They turned aside. Uh, Moses comes down and I said he breaks the tablets, then he goes and he makes new tablets, and then you have essentially, so the entire, that's really the majority of the end of the chapter, God gives them a command to leave Mount Sinai, going out into the wilderness, that was really, they were instructed, okay, God giving them instructions, they bring, he brings them out of Egypt, through the Red Sea, right to Mount Sinai, okay, they're after Mount Sinai for about a year, I think, eight months to a year, and then God gives them the command, okay, you've been instructed, now leave. Now you can enter the promised land. They don't get there, right? Forty years of wandering, and the generation initially who came out of the wilderness dies in the wilderness, and the next generation is instructed. But that's what we have essentially from 33 uh, to the end of the book. I'm just going to read one verse at the end of the book and end right here. Okay, so if you go to Exodus 40, 
verse 34. So we have the building of the tabernacle. Everything that God instructed them to do, now they're starting to do. They've been instructed, now they're acting on it. And this will, this will finalize this chapter, 40 and 34. Then the cloud covered the tabernacle of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able, able to enter the tabernacle of meeting because the cloud rested above it. The glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Whenever the cloud was taken up from above the tabernacle, the children of Israel would go onward in their journeys. But if the cloud was not taken up, then they did not journey till the day it was taken up. For the cloud of the Lord was above the tabernacle by day, and fire was over it by night. And the sight of the Lord, uh, in the sight of all the house of Israel, throughout all their journeys. So, what happens here? They're led and guided by God. If God says stay, they stay. If He says go, they go. And that's us as believers, right? It's very much applicable to us as believers. If God says stay, if He hasn't moved you, stay where you're at. Well, how do I know? He'll make it clear. As clear as a cloud and fire by day, He'll make it clear if He wants you to be somewhere else. Otherwise, stay where you've been planted. Amen. All right, let's close there. Father God, we thank You. We come before You, Lord. We thank You for Your Word. We thank You for what You're doing in our hearts, Lord. Let us not rest in what we're trying to do for You, Lord, but let's rest in what You've already done for us and allow You to work in our lives to do what it is You want us to do, Lord. Everything in us that's going to get done for You is going to be done by You. So we rest in that fact, Lord. We rest in the fact that You're our provider. Lord, You are the one who is our helper. Your Holy Spirit is our comforter. Lord, and we need You for everything that we could ever do, ask, or think. Thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.